I would like to bring into the discussion Stephen Hahn, who is an American physician who served as the United States Commissioner of Food and Drugs from 2019 to 2021. Uh, before becoming Commissioner, Steve Hahn was an oncologist serving as Chief Medical Executive of the uh, MD Anderson Center Cancer Center in the United States. So, uh, Steve Hahn, welcome to the 2021 World Cancer Leaders Summit. It's wonderful to see you. Um, now, as I've explained to our audience before, we have over 600 World Cancer Leaders who are joining us uh, for this summit and we're so thrilled to have you on board for this particular topic talking about COVID-19 vaccines and cancer control. I'm going to start just asking you a, a couple of questions myself um, and then uh, what we would like to do is encourage all of the audience to ask questions via the platform question box as they will have just been doing previously with uh, Atul Gawande. So, um, Dr. Han, if I can come to you first. As I said, welcome. Um, you were commissioner of the FDA when the COVID-19 vaccines were first being uh, developed um, and introduced as well. An incredibly exciting time in, in the development of these, of these vaccines, of course, and in the fight against the global pandemic more broadly. And I'm guessing it also showed a really transformational relationship between the public and private sector. And I'm wondering if you can just talk us through that a little bit more. Well, Hannah, first of all, thank you for this invitation and being here today. It's great to be present with colleagues at the World Cancer Leaders Summit. It's a terrific group, and, and thank you. So um, it was an exciting time, but also quite a challenge for the world, and particularly those who suffered from COVID. And, and I just want to, of course, pay my respects to those who, who, who's, who had COVID and who died from COVID. That uh, was a significant uh, uh, you know, impact on the entire world. Two major observations from the pandemic. One is the incredible importance of the relationship between the private sector, academia, and government coming together to really address an urgent health problem. And the second major observation for me was that um, we, we always talked and knew about healthcare disparities, but we saw that play out in a really uh, on a global stage. Uh, we certainly saw it in the United States, but we also saw it globally. And, and one of the things we have to think about as we address the first issue, which is let's try to duplicate what we saw with COVID-19 and vaccines, that is bring people together to serve urgent problems, uh, healthcare problems. Uh, but, but then let's also make sure we don't leave anybody behind. And so I, I think what we learned was that we can do this in an expedited fashion. We can bring innovation to people. We can bring products that help improve lives, in this case, COVID-19 vaccines. And we can do it in a way that doesn't uh, get stuck in old paradigms that slow things down. And by the way, we can do it in a way that makes sure that, that as the FDA, as, as a standard of this, that whatever we're working on is safe and effective. And I think those are the two major lessons I took away from COVID-19 that we can sort of speed up innovation in cancer care as a result of the, the lessons that we've learned from, from COVID-19? Yes, well, certainly um, cancer care, all types of care, all types of innovation, since we're focused on cancer here, yes. What's really interesting, Hannah, is that I will argue that um, cancer care, cancer treatments led the way in this expedited approach to development of innovation, and we can do a lot better. But what we saw over the last several years, particularly uh, at the FDA with accelerated approval, was the movement of drugs very quickly from a preclinical concept uh, into, into patients, and then ultimately with the accelerated approval, with then some post-marketing need for uh, further study. We, we're seeing that with the COVID vaccines, and we saw that with a recent decision on an on a Alzheimer's drug at the agency. My point being is there's no reason we can't apply these same principles to cancer care, and we should. And at the same, same time, make sure that it's available to all. That's so interesting that you say that it was actually cancer care that led the way on this rather than the other way round. I'm wondering then whether as a result of a global pandemic that caught us all off, you know, off guard to some extent, whether cancer care has suffered directly as a result, having led the way initially and then it's now suffered directly as a result of COVID-19. Well, just to get back to that first point, we in COVID-19 at the agency were asked to cut red tape and allow for expedited work. And, and we had really learned that lesson in, in the Oncology uh, Center of Excellence. And so really this was not just cutting and pasting, but really learning from that experience and moving forward. Uh, you know, unfortunately, what we saw is incredibly, incredible devastation in terms of social, cultural, 
um, and healthcare impact from COVID-19, not just those who suffered COVID-19 and, and died from COVID-19, but also in terms of routine care. And, and we've seen all the statistics, a lot of articles about this, how people delayed, and, and rightfully so, given, given the, the, the pandemic, the fear associated with that, the shutdown of some essential healthcare services, delayed cancer screening as well as going for cancer care. And we can do certain things around the margin, like change our clinical trials to make them you know, more uh, executable during um, a, a situation like COVID-19. And I think that'll move into the future. But we also saw that the, the access and the ability to, to get to screening and to treatments was, was more limited. I fear that what we're going to see um, is some effect ultimately on morbidity and mortality. I don't know the answer to that question. And I know that my colleagues around the world are playing catch up, but there's no question that's what we saw. And we really have to urgently address that problem. One of the things I'd like to see certainly is you know, more attention paid to cancer, cancer screening and identification of early stage disease, because that's one of the ways that we can play catch up here. And uh, Steve, look, I know you're an oncologist by, by training as well. And one of the things that I think a lot of people around the world, not just in the cancer community, but people around the world, when the COVID-19 vaccines were being developed, they were nervous about the speed in which they were coming to fruition and then suddenly being introduced. Has there been enough time for, for testing, for checks and balances? What can we learn from that? And, and what checks and balances do you think need to be in place when it comes to developing cancer treatments? And Hannah, this is such an important question because I totally believe that you don't have to sacrifice quality for speed. In other words, I do not think it's a sort of dichotomous, yes, speed, but at the expense of quality. So let's just uh, dissect a little bit the COVID-19 vaccine. Early on, March of 2020, Peter Marks, who's the head of the Center for Biologic Evaluation Research, which has the vaccine division, and I spent a lot of time talking about what does it look like to work with developers of vaccines? Because I think we all understood early on that one of the most important ways of getting out of the COVID-19 pandemic was to actually do that. So there were a lot of um, approaches that were used on the legal side that, that helped with respect to companies working together. But really what this was, was direct interaction between the agency and the developers of vaccine. What I'm gonna to refer to is rolling applications. So discussions ahead of time about what the clinical trials will look like, frequent updates on the data so that you don't have to submit a complete data package to the FDA. You can seamlessly move from phase one to phase two to phase three. And the bottom line here is no corners were cut with respect to the normal development process of vaccines. Every step was taken, carefully considered, decisions were made upon the science and data, and then moved by late summer to phase three clinical trials. Now, what we did was we used emergency use authorization, and in normal situations, that is a non-healthcare emergency, we're going to use typical approval processes at the FDA. But, but the uh, you know, Congress allowed us to use emergency use authorization. We had collected uh, data, I think very good data, in very large randomized clinical trials. And these randomized clinical trials were about double the size of the average trial for vaccines um, in the history of FDA and the, and the vaccine approval process. What we didn't have, what we needed to collect more data on was a longer term follow up with safety and more information about manufacturing. And so we had sufficient information to make sure that at least from a, a significant point of view, there was safety associated with the vaccines. Um, because uh, the time point that we chose, there had to be follow-up of patients on the vaccine uh, trial, subject in the vaccine trial, was about 90% in terms of seeing all the side effects. Um, and then we, we, of course, gathered real-world evidence. And Hannah, I'm going to postulate to you that the data we've now collected, the hundreds of millions of people who've received these vaccines, we've never had vaccines where we've accumulated such data on both efficacy and safety in such a short period of time. Now, there's a lesson there, right? Can we use experts? expedited approval with some reasonable assurance that a cancer therapy is safe and effective, and then at the same time collect data post-commercialization uh, so that in, in all sorts of settings so that we can get additional data on safety and efficacy. And then maybe what happens is we narrow the indications for the treatment, we expand it, it depends on what the data show. But I think this can be replicated, maybe not in the same time frame, but, but pretty close.
Yeah, and certainly cancer patients who might be even listening to this right now will be thinking, yes, please, can you expedite it and quickly get these right. kind of treatments out um, so that I can benefit from and it And Hannah, well. good point. I'm sorry to interrupt. Good point because, you know, vaccines, there's a certain standard for safety because you're not treating someone who's sick. Mm. A cancer patient, um, ha there's a different standard that's used in terms of risk benefit. Mm. And cancer patients understand this. We explain that to them. So, so yes, the same situation could be used. Sorry. Yeah. I want, no, absolutely, like j jump in whenever you feel like it. Um, Steve, I want to talk to you about uh, a bit about innovation as well. Innovation is broadly seen as a, as a good thing, but obviously the, the, the fruits of innovation are often going to be enjoyed more by perhaps economically stable uh, regions as opposed to, to others or more vulnerable populations, for example. So how can we better address all these sort of disparities in innovation, whether it be in health or medicines, technologies, effective programs, et cetera? Yes, so Hannah, um, perhaps what I'm gonna say is controversial and maybe even seems a bit contradictory. But on the one hand, what we saw is a robust private sector leading the way in partnership with academia and government to develop COVID-19 vaccines, therapeutics, et cetera. So we saw that. So we have to be careful that whatever we put in place does not create barriers to innovation. In fact, we should have a very high bar to anything that creates barriers to innovation. On the other hand, I think we need to create incentives for the private sector to work in partnership with government and with academia to actually make sure that those who have not been traditionally included in both clinical trials and also the commercialization of a product are included. And I think there's lots of opportunity there. So what if our regulatory bodies around the world had pathways that incented the private sector to make sure there was appropriate inclusion in the clinical trials, that there was real outreach that broke down the barriers of distrust that we have with medicine and clinical research, and then also broke down the barriers to make sure that we had adequate uh, delivery of innovative products into the hands of people who don't traditionally have that access to those products. And, and so I think there are ways of doing this. And I think that the private sector can help us here in partnership with government. It's something that I feel very passionate about. Mm -hmm. But I, I, again, go back to the fact that we, we have had innovation. We saw what the private sector could do in, in collaboration with academia and government. And we need to make sure we don't you know stifle that. Uh, one question. Um in terms of incentivizing the private sector, would like change to the rules of intellectual property be part of that? Well, again, I, I, I think we, you know, uh, the, two things about that. One is, was very well aware at this, the agency. There, is, there are abuses of the intellectual property system, certainly in the United States. Um, there's something called the patent thicket, et cetera, that, that makes it more difficult for drugs to become generics for, for, for you know, for, you know, a period of time. Mm. And the bottom line is we need to address those issues. We need to address abuses. On the other hand, intellectual property is the driver for the private sector to make those developments because people put, uh, um, you know, a capital at risk to develop these products. And there, right. there has to be some sort of return or it doesn't work. But there needs to be a balance. We can't have one more than the other. We need to make sure that there are appropriate checks and balances. Now, one of those is the FDA, right? The FDA, MHRA, EMA, the Japanese regulatory agencies, Canadian, et cetera, are all in place to make sure that products are evaluated in an appropriate fashion and that they're safe and effective and that the right decisions are being made. So that's one check and balance. But there also has to be a check and balance on the other side with respect to intellectual property. So yes, I think we need to have a system that incents the private sector, but we can't have we can't have abuses because that basically takes away from the system and that hurts the development and innovation as well. And one final question from me before we then come on to questions uh, from our leaders who are joining us as well. How can we make um, innovation then in cancer more affordable, more, more equitable and sustainable? Yeah, um, well, one of the ways that we can do this, and I feel very strongly about it, is that we can actually reduce the cost it takes to bring innovation to people. So we know that for, let's take drugs, for example, it costs hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to bring a therapeutic to market. Um, we need to do something about that. There are uh, lessons learned from COVID in terms of how we perform clinical trials, how we engage people. And so if we can reduce the cost associated with the development 
of therapeutics, I think we can go a long way toward this. And then we have to think about, you know, are there are there ways that at least in the United States that people think about, you know, the, the cost benefit, uh, 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 you know, assessment of, of any innovative therapy. And um, I think the collection of real world data um, after commercialization, the requirement that that be used subsequently for regulatory decisions as opposed to a voluntary system will help and go a long way to helping us reduce costs. And also, by the way, increase access. And we need to keep the pressure um, on the private sector to make sure that appropriate access, both to clinical trials as well as gathering additional data and obviously entry into the market takes place. Okay, Steve, stay with us because we've had a flurry of questions coming in for you. So yeah. if you can uh, bear with us and, and, and I'll try to get to as many of them as we, as time allows us to do. Um, first one, how would you build on the momentum from the vaccine development to address new cancer therapies? So we've, we've touched on this a bit, but how would you build on that particular momentum from the pandemic? Yeah, so, so we really need worldwide um, a coalition, if you will, of the private sector academia. The World Cancer Leaders Summit, um, I know there's a lot of willing voices at the agency, regulatory bodies and other government agencies. And we need to urgently form that. And, and cancer is a great place to start. Neurodegenerative diseases again, infectious diseases, et cetera. One of the things that I'm working on in my current job is to ask the question, can we intervene in diseases early can we identify them and develop therapeutics early? Um, and, and what we need to be able to do that is the partnership of the private sector who can't do it alone with government and academia. So my call is let's get forward with these you know, groups coming together. World Cancer Leaders Group can really lead the way here. And then let's think about these innovative ways and let's propose these to legislators, governments around the world, regulatory agencies to try to help move this forward. I think there's a willing voice now, particularly in the private sector, given to the success we've seen with COVID-19 vaccines and now COVID um, therapeutics. And I think now's the time to take the action, but never forgetting about the fact that we can't leave people behind. Uh, I think advocacy is your next calling in life. Um, right, I'm going to move on to the next question as well. Uh, can you elaborate on lessons learned from the emergency approval of COVID-19 vaccines uh, towards enhancing uh, regulatory approvals for, for cancer medicines that show significant clinical benefit? You talked earlier about the, the, the speed and you thinking that it doesn't need to be one or the yeah. other. So I'll give you the example with COVID-19 vaccines. So we required in the clinical trials that there be clinical benefit. That clinical benefit could have been turning COVID into a cold as opposed to a deathly disease or a, a, a disease that caused mortality, mm -hmm. um, or it could be totally prevention of COVID. But the flexibility around the efficacy endpoint allowed us to have um, a more pragmatic approach to this. And of course, that can be true for cancer. Can we think of ways that efficacy endpoints in large trials can give us that flexibility as long as there is real clinical benefit. And, and we didn't do it in COVID-19, but you could think about cancer where you could use either intermediate endpoints or surrogate endpoints to allow you to come to a decision sooner. And that of course is the basis for the accelerated approval process. And then let's flip to the, the safety side. We actually recommended and, and demanded that these trials have safety data for the uh, for 50 percent, the median number of subjects in a trial, um, at least a certain number of days, 60 days after enrollment or completion of the trial. Now, why was that? The science and the data showed us that over 90 percent of all side effects were seen in that period of time, maybe even closer to 95. And the bottom line is we then felt comfortable in an emergency situation with this risk benefit calculus. The same kind of logic could be applied to cancer therapeutics. And then finally, what agencies around the world, including the FDA, need to do a better job of is explaining that. Because all of us cancer doctors, cancer nurses, cancer providers know that when you sit in front of a patient, you talk about risk benefit. And that's what needs to be done in terms of regulatory decisions so that there's a lot of clarity and it's an open box for people. Steve, another question for you. Please comment on the role of the uh, the cooperation between industry and government, so private public sector, to accelerate progress in cancer control. Yeah, well, I think of the $10 billion that the U.S. Congress allocated for Operation Warp Speed will go down in history as 
one of the sanest investments that a government ever made. <laughs> um, it really allowed for the uh, rapid development and putting the development at risk. Now, we don't necessarily need that moving forward. We may in some situations, but it was an emergency. But I think that was historic in terms of getting together to develop diagnostic tests, therapeutics, and vaccines. And I think it's a model for the future. Uh, another question that's come in. One of the drivers for the, uh, the, the rapid development of COVID vaccines was the government's prioritizing of global health security uh, and the willingness to purchase these large volumes of vaccines in a, in a very short amount of time. How likely is it then that these sort of circumstances could be seen or replicated in some way for cancer care? And cancer control. A hundred percent, I think that can be replicated. And not just cancer care, but also in infectious diseases, anticipating the next pandemic. You know, in cancer, we have a lot of information. We have a lot of parallel development tracks going on right now. And there's a really a ton, a very much a lot of, particularly in biotechnology, a lot of innovative therapies being developed. We have to open our minds. We have to basically clear the decks with respect to our regulatory approach and take new thinking. So as we develop new platforms for the development of therapeutics and, and where I'm working now, flagship pioneering, it's very common for that to occur, but other great companies around the world are doing this. What we're doing um, is developing new approaches to cancer care. And those do present regulatory challenges because they're new, but we can apply the same principles that we used for COVID-19 vaccine development to these new therapeutics as well. I think it's 100% possible. Again, advocacy from groups like World Cancer Leaders Summit, World Health Organization, et cetera, could really be crucial for this. You sound very upbeat, <laughs> which is lovely for a, a World Cancer Leaders Summit as well. I'm wondering how hopeful, this is a question from me, not the one that's come in from the audience, but I'm wondering how hopeful you are about the future, given the, the, your roles in both the public and private sectors, uh, and whether you think with future pandemics around the corner, and obviously focusing on cancer care as well, whether you think that we're better equipped now, having learned the lessons of the recent past. Oh, <clears throat> outstanding, uh, Hannah, really outstanding. So <clears throat> right now, because it's fresh in our mind, because COVID hasn't gone away, I think absolutely. That's why I'm saying strike while the iron's hot. Now's the time to actually do this. Now, what we're going to see, because I think it's human nature and it's governments, we're going to see drift. You know, five years from now, are we going to allow a, our our the world to be less prepared than it is right now. And that's something that I think we all need to guard against. We need to make it part of our DNA. We need to make it part of our regular approach to innovative healthcare products developments to do what we did during COVID. We cannot go back. We need to create and write the next chapters in the book. And they have to look very similar in terms of speeding innovation. But I'm going to go back to something I've said about 10 times, and I apologize, Hannah, but we cannot leave people behind. And so we've got to do this in a way that allows us to make sure it's available to everybody, because everyone deserves the absolute best cancer care. Well, your enthusiasm is infectious and your positivity is, is good for the soul as well. So we are so appreciative of your time today, Dr. Steve Hahn. Thank you very much indeed for joining us for this World Cancer Leaders Summit. Uh, we are going to take a short break now, uh, where again, we would like to encourage all of you to connect with each other on the summit platform. You know where to do that. And I'll see you very shortly.